All right, thanks, Eric. And thanks to the organizers for putting together this conference. Uh, it's been very good. So I want to talk about some recent work with uh, Mitsu Berinsky and uh, my student, Max Meinig. And I'll also be mentioning some work uh, done recently with Abidu Kostin, who is a mathematician who's done a lot of work in uh, the theory of resurgent trend series. Okay. Right. So the motivation. I want to put together, try to put together two things. One, we all know very well, this underlying Hopf algebra structure from perturbative quantum field theory renormalization. And one of the advantages of this from a practical point of view in, in quantum field theory is that it enables doing perturbative computations and understanding perturbative structures at very high order that's hard to access in other ways. I want to think about combining this with a Carl's theory of resurgent asymptotics, which is a very general theory, but we can think of it here as a way of extracting non perturbative information from formal perturbative series. And the advantage from the physics point of view is that there is physics beyond perturbative uh, expansions, which we call non perturbative physics. And the question is whether that has any natural home in the world of Hopf algebras. I'm not able to, okay. So the idea is to try and use these resurgent trend series structures to decode some non-perturbative information about quantum field theories from their perturbative Hopf algebra structure. So just a few words because people may not be very familiar with resurgent trend series, although a lot of people here are. The resurgent functions can be described in many ways, but one way to think of them is that they're closed under essentially all operations in analysis. And the operations we'll be interested in are things like Borel transforms, analytic continuations, inverse Borel transforms, things like that, monodromies. In applications so far in quantum mechanics and quantum field theories and in matrix models, the general structure looks something like this, that you have some formal series in some small parameter X, but you include also these beyond all orders, um, exponentially small things, which we would call instantons or non-perturbative terms, and also powers of logarithms. And the essential result is that iterations of these three basic structures of X and e to the minus some constant over X and log X generate this huge class of so-called analyzable functions, which is much more general than uh, standard analytic functions. And we also know from quantum field theory calculations and various uh, asymptotic expansions in large masses or large momenta or strong coupling, weak coupling, that these are exactly the objects out of which these asymptotic expansions are built. One of the advantages of this resurgent approach is that this trans series, this generalized series, actually encodes analytic continuation information about the function you're trying to describe. Whereas if you just have some formal asymptotic series, it tells you something about the function, but it doesn't tell you everything about the function. And if this is achieved, if you can generate such a trend, in order to reinstate this analytic continuation property. So this was developed by Akal in the context of um, dynamical systems, and it's been explored in great detail in differential equation theory, difference equation theory, and it's been applied in quantum mechanics, matrix models, quantum field theory, and string theory. The things that are best understood are in the world of differential equations and difference equations. The word resurgence, if you're not familiar with this, here's an image to think of that there are some critical points in your problem. Think of them as singularities of a Borel transform of a, a formal perturbative series that's asymptotic. And so there are fluctuations around these singular points. And the idea is that this, the behavior near any given singular point encodes information about the behavior near other singular or critical points. And so these functions in some sense resurrect or surge up again, resurge near these other critical points. So that's the general perspective. 
And we can make it much more concrete once we're in a particular realm of talking about an integral equation or a difference equation or whatnot. But the basic advantage from the, the sort of appeal of this formalism from the physics point of view is that it means that there should be some quantitative relationship between the fluctuations around different uh, critical points, which if we think in terms of a functional integral would mean different saddle points of the functional integral. So what about going towards quantum field theory? So there are many examples at this point in matrix models and quantum mechanics. Although having said that, there is a lot of room for uh, rigorous foundations to be solidified here. Once you go to quantum field theory, the fact that we have to deal with renormalization makes this whole story much more interesting because the expansion parameter is not just some small expansion parameter, it's actually running according to some well-defined uh, renormalization group structure. There's been a lot of recent progress in the last five to 10 years for specifically uh, regularized quantum field theories at some, um, in some semi-classical regime and also in lattice quantum field theory. What I wanna talk about here is something different. And the idea is to try and see how this resurgence structure fits together with this, the Hopf algebra structure. And so the starting point is to try and find the simplest possible example where you can explore what this uh, looks like. So the main question I have in red is that if we think of the Dyson Schwinger equations for the quantum field theory, which we usually um, formulate in a formal perturbative sense. An interesting question is, do those equations contain all of the information about the quantum field theory? If it happens to be a quantum field theory that has non-trivial, um, non-perturbative features. If the answer is yes, then you can ask further, how can you actually extract or decode that non-perturbative information from the perturbative formal series in a practical, possibly numerical way? And possibly the most interesting question is, given that this Hopf algebraic structure is so natural and so elegant and so efficient at the perturbative level, is there some natural way that it fits into the so-called bridge equations of a car, which are the relations that relate all these different critical points? So these different critical points are associated with different non-perturbative features. So three papers from this from years ago from Dirk that uh, at least in my thinking have been very influential in how to understand Dyson Schwinger equations. So th these have some very beautiful features in them that we can take advantage of here um, to start thinking along these lines. So the one way to phrase um, one of the conclusions of these papers is that for certain quantum field theories, when you combine the RG equations with this Hopf algebra structure, you can reduce some part of the problem to a set of nonlinear ordinary differential equations for the anomalous dimensions of the problem. And this is the realm in which resurgence is best understood. There are a lot of both rigorous results and practical results for understanding resurgence once you're in the world of talking about nonlinear differential equations. So this is a completely natural place to start. I, I emphasize that it's just the beginning, it's not the general picture, but I think it's worth having some very concrete examples to un understand before trying to formulate the more general case, which would be aiming for something in the world of gauge theories. So there are some well-studied examples, and I think we'll hopefully hear from Mark uh, tomorrow, I guess. Maybe he'll say something about this uh, beautiful work on the Western Minnow model. And uh, recent paper with Michi, we studied the four-dimensional Yukawa model, and there'll be soon, hopefully, a paper about this six-dimensional phi cube theory, which also Mark and Enrico have a recent paper about that. So just a summary of what's known in the for a nonlinear ODEs. So I'm using the notation from a famous paper by Ovidio Kostin. You can write an nth order nonlinear ODE in first order form, form. So you make this an n component vector. So y prime is just some function of the variable and y. And under certain conditions that are not too strenuous, you can, you can 
form this into a normal form where there's some formal perturbative series. And then these are the eigenvalues of the first derivatives of F and then uh, one over Z uh, expansion and the rest is suppressed at large Z. Once you have it in this normal form, it's completely clear that the solution has the form of a, a formal series an expansion here, here um, Z is like one over H bar. So an expansion in inverse powers of Z. But then because of these terms here, you get exponential contributions. And here you get inverse powers of Z depending on the eigenvalues. So you can diagonalize this with eigenvalues beta one, beta two up to beta N. And then this nonlinear stuff generates some formal series. So this is an example of a trend series. Here we have just a formal series in inverse powers of Z, but it's complemented with these exponentially small beyond all orders terms with some prefactor fluctuation terms and also multiplied by formal for the formal series. And there are very rich bridge equations which relate the structure of these various fluctuation series to one another and to the original um, formal uh, divergent series. And these are called the algebraic bridge equations. And if you form the singularity, the uh, Borel transforms of these functions here, then the singularities of those Borel transforms label exactly the non-perturbative physics terms, which are these terms beyond all orders. These parameters here, sigma one up to sigma n, are the n independent parameters giving the boundary conditions of this nth order differential equation. And they're called trans series parameters. And here's a quote from this uh, paper of uh, Kostin, that one of the interesting consequences of this structure is that given one formal solution, this thing here, you can actually generate from that a whole family of uh, solutions beyond the formal asymptotics. So what I'm gonna do is explore how this actually works in some particular examples of dyson schwinger equations. So the easiest one to start with is this uh, example from this paper of uh, David and Dirk of the four dimensional massless Yukawa theory. I don't think I need to spend terribly much time on this. There's a simple Dyson Springer equation iterating these um, self energy terms and the anomalous dimension in a uh, momentum scheme defined this way in terms of the renormalized coupling leads to a RG equation that's this nonlinear first order differential equation. So this is the result of this uh, paper. And now given that we can study the formal um, expansion of this. And this was done by David and Doak and it has some very interesting combinatorial structure and asymptotic structure. So I've just rescaled a little bit just to clean things up. Instead of a function of alpha, divide alpha by four and Here's the nonlinear equation. Again, you see it's quadratic in this function C. C is essentially the rescale of the anomalous dimension, but it's first order in the derivative. And this rescaling has been done so that the expansion coefficients here are integers. And this is interesting combinatorially because these numbers correspond to the, the expansion of the generating function for connected chord diagrams. These numbers also have interesting large order asymptotics. They diverge factorially, uh, gamma n plus a half, and there are subleading corrections going like gamma of n minus a half, gamma of n minus three halves. So this is the typical generic type of factorial divergence that is found very often in quantum mechanical and quantum field theory um, asymptotic expansions. But this can't be the full solution to this differential equation because there are no boundary condition parameters here. And this is a first order equation. So there must be something else beyond this formal series. And this is a simple example of this idea of Eckhart that we generalize this formal series to a trans series with one trans series parameter. It's a first order equation. And the first power of this parameter sigma would just be this formal series, but the higher powers would correspond to these um, exponentially suppressed terms. So in practice, you simply, it's extremely simple to implement. You simply insert this type of ansatz into the differential equation, connect power, collect powers of sigma, 
And you see that you have a nonlinear non equation for C0, the perturbative series, but all of these other ones satisfy linear but inhomogeneous equations. And you can solve them, it turns out, with a little bit of work. And here's the first term here. It's actually expressed as an exponentially small contribution involving C0. So this is an example of this feature of resurgence that the, this exponentially small contribution, non-perturbative contribution, corresponding to say the one instant on correction to this formal series is explicitly expressed in terms of the formal series itself. Moreover, you can make an asymptotic expansion of this quantity here at uh, small x, and there's this exponentially small instanton factor, and then it's multiplied by another formal series with certain coefficients that you can simply generate very easily since you know this. And now you look at these coefficients and go back and look at this large order behavior of the formal series coefficients, and you notice something very interesting, that these numbers here are just identically equal to the coefficients of the subleading corrections to the large order behavior of the perturbative series coefficients. So this is a generic feature of resurgence that the large order behavior of a, the expansion around a given um, instanton sector, here the zero instanton sector, show up again in the expansion around another instanton sector. And these coefficients here in C1, this one, five halves, this here, have also some interesting combinatorics um, associated with them, recent work of Karen and Ali. So we can continue this. We can actually look at these coefficients of the C1 and look at its, sorry, their large order growth. And we generate another set of numbers here. And then we can go to the differential equation and look at the next exponentially suppressed term. And again, we see the same feature. These coefficients here show up in the low order expansion of the fluctuations around a higher exponential term. In fact, you can continue this to all orders in the expansion and generate a completely uh, all orders summation for the full trend series. So just to remind you what we've done, we've generalized this formal perturbative series solution to this differential equation, this dyson schwinger equation, to a sum over what I'd be calling non-perturbative instanton terms. And each of these, it turns out, can be expressed in terms of C0, the lowest one. And not only that, not only can each of them be expressed in terms of C0, you can completely resum to all orders with this generating function here, little f, which is some uh, function of two variables. And you'll notice that this is exactly the structure of this C1 solution here. So this itself is just exponentiated again, and that gives you the all orders complete uh, non-perturbative solution of this dyson schwinger equation. So this is an illustration that we can indeed implement this resurgent asymptotics um, structure of a car, this general structure. And since this is a first order differential equation in this case, even though it's not linear, we can carry out all of these steps in complete generality. I would also like to mention that another way to do this calculation is using this nice alien derivative structure that uh, Mishi developed, where you use the fact that there's a functional relation satisfied by this function C of X and applying this uh, alien derivative, which is the thing that gives you this uh, structure of bridge equations on all the singularities of the Borel transform, you can generate exactly the same all orders resummation. So just to summarize, here's the picture again. Imagine we started here with the formal divergent asymptotic expansion coming directly from the um, perturbative Hopf algebra structure. Using that nonlinear equation derived by uh, David and Dirk, we can actually generate all of the other non perturbative terms directly and show that they are, they correspond exactly to the singularities of the Borel transform of the perturbative series. 
and that they're all expressible in terms of the original formal series. So this is uh, reassuring that one can actually do this in complete detail. So this hints the conclusion would be that indeed these dyson schwinger equations have all of this non-perturbative information. You just have to do a little bit more um, work to extract it. So having done that, we can turn now to a slightly more uh, complicated and more interesting quantum field theory, also studied by uh, David and Dirk in their papers, which is phi cube theory in six dimensions. And I'll use this expansion parameter alpha, the natural expansion parameter alpha. So this theory is interesting because it's asymptotically free. Six dimensions is the critical dimension of this theory. It has a known Lepatov style instant time. So that's a non-perturbative feature of the theory coming from a saddle point of the functional integral, not directly from some diagrammatic perturbative expansion. It's also interesting because it has a Renormalin chain structure from chains of these uh, um, bubble diagrams. So all of these features here that I've listed hint at the um, possibility of interesting non-perturbative physics in this system. So in their work uh, now 10 years ago, David and Dirk uncovered a third order nonlinear differential equation for the anomalous dimension in this theory. So I've done a little bit of rescaling again to just get things in sort of natural units. And here's the third order equation. So you see there are three derivatives. It's fourth order in nonlinearity in C. It has this very interesting factorized type structure. And David and Dirk studied the perturbative solution to this equation. You just expand in small powers of x. And with some appropriate rescaling here, you have integer um, expansion coefficients. And I've listed the first few of them here. And as far as is known at this point, these interesting integers do not have any direct combinatorial interpretation. So that's an interesting open problem. Whereas in the Yukawa system, the corresponding sequence of integers had an interpretation in terms of these connected chord diagrams. So David and Dirk generated, I think, 30 or so of these coefficients and found indeed factorial divergence, establishing that this was an asymptotic expansion. And they also studied the Burrell summation of this. So with some more data, and we publicly thank uh, David here for sending us a huge file of coefficients for us to play with. You can generate more refined asymptotics. So first of all, this is 12 at the end, just from the natural um, uh, rescaling. But the factorial divergence is in fact not gamma of n plus two, it's gamma of n plus 23 over 12. And you can actually generate these subleading corrections. And there are these particular coefficients corresponding to gamma of n plus 11 twelfths and gamma of n plus n minus one twelfths. So this has a very similar form from compared to the asymptotics in the previous Yukawa case. However, this was a third order nonlinear differential equation. So from the theorem of uh, Ovidio Kostin, this means that there are actually three missing boundary condition parameters, not just one of these sigma trans series expansion parameters. There must be three of them lurking somewhere. And to find them is actually quite simple. You just insert an ansatz for the uh, form of the expansion with this exponentially small term beyond all um, perturbative orders with some as yet undetermined prefactor power multiplied by a formal series in powers of x. And just inserting that into the differential equation, it's very easy to see that there are only three possible solutions and they're combinations lambda and beta when lambda equals one, lambda equals two, and lambda equals three with corresponding rational uh, values of beta. And you should recognize this 23 over 12 here as this 23 over 12 here. And there's a very natural reason for that, which I'll explain in, in a minute. 
another interesting feature of this is that these lambda parameters, which are, remember, these are identified with the locations of the singularities of the Borel transform of this formal solution, of the formal solution to this problem, they're actually resonant. They're multiples of one another. Whereas for a generic third order equation, these three eigenvalues lambda would be at any um, points in the complex plane. And this is related to the fact that this equation factorizes into this um, factorized form with one, two, and three here responsible for this one, two, and three. So what I'd like to talk about now is to explore this uh, non-perturbative structure with these three different types of non-perturbative terms. So what it means is that the full trans-series structure has the formal perturbative series. Remember, this is the thing coming directly from a formal expansion of this Hopf algebra structure. But the full solution to the differential equation can be uh, expanded to the form of a trans-series with three trans-series parameters, sigma one, sigma two, sigma three. These correspond to these three basic solutions from this trans-series ansatz. And powers of the corresponding instant on factors here with these strange rational factors. And each of these is multiplied by some formal series. And then there are plus dot, 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 where you mix these various terms. But these are the basic series, um, seed non-perturbative terms. So given that you have an explicit differential equation and you have the form of what the trans series should look like, and if you have access to something like Maple or Mathematica, you can simply insert this into the differential equation and start generating many terms in this series. So it's not something you wanna do by hand, but it's fairly straightforward to do this using some um, mathematical um, manipulation program. So for example, you can look at the first few terms of this series here at the k equals one level. So the first instanton term with the lowest, um, so the dominant exponentially suppressed terms. And the first few coefficients are some rational numbers here, which uh, you can get from the um, differential equation. But those numbers here should look familiar. They're actually the terms appearing in the subleading corrections to the large order behavior of the expansion of, these, of this formal series. So this is again, an example of this generic resurgent structure that the large order behavior of the coefficients of this formal series resurge in a natural form in the low orders of the expansions here around these non-perturbative terms. So this is just one manifestation, one example of this infinite set of resurgence relations implied by um, a Carlos bridge equations. So there are all these relations between the different exponential contributions, which remember correspond to the different Borel singularities. They're all related by some intricate algebraic set of relations. And this is one of the examples where we can actually see it in, uh, in full detail. To go beyond this, so this you can do just by things like um, studying the uh, large order growth of the coefficients. So you can do ratio tests and then you can accelerate this with, um, with um, things like Richardson uh, acceleration. But to go beyond this, since there are these three different um, Borel singularities, to go beyond this, it's really necessary to invoke not just this sort of combinatorial treatment, but it seems to be much more powerful to go to the Borel plane and start using more analytic properties. So remember what I'm calling non-perturbative information, these are directly related to these um, Borel singularities. So remember what a Borel transform does it, is it takes a formal asymptotic series such as would be produced by this Hopf algebra, um, Dutch and Schwinger equations and converts it by factoring out the overall factorial growth, converts it into a convergent Borel transform 
But the Borel transform function is convergent, but it has singularities in the Borel plane. And those singularities correspond to these exponentially small um, corrections to the formal series when you do the inverse Borel transform, which is a Laplace transform. So what, from the quantum field theory point of view, the locations of those Borel singularities correspond to what we would call instantons or renormalons. And the nature of those singularities, whether they're branch cuts or if they're square root branch cuts or logarithmic branch cuts or whatever type of branch cuts, the nature of those facts tell you something about the Gaussian fluctuations around those non-perturbative um, objects. And the Stokes constants, which are the constants appearing in front of this uh, overall factorial growth, the Stokes constants tell you something about the strength of these instanton terms and how they relate to one another through these bridge equations. So this is interesting and important information that you would like to be able to extract from the differential equation and in fact, extract it from just this formal series solution to the differential equation. So to do this, you need to use, first of all, work in the Borel plane where you have some convergent series to deal with. And it turns out that to do this to the required and desired precision requires some new methods of uh, Borel analysis. And this is the work I've been doing recently with the video custom. A very common um, method used by both mathematicians and physicists is so-called borel pade which is once you go to the Borel plane, you have a convergent um, series and you would like to understand the singularities. But of course, in practice, you don't have necessarily all the terms of that convergent series. You might only have 10 terms or 50 terms or 100 terms. So in order to study the singularities of that function, which is in the end just a polynomial, one possible approach, which is very powerful, is to make a Pade approximant to that uh, truncated expansion. And the Pade approximant um, represents that truncated series as a ratio of polynomials. And so its singularities are necessarily only poles. And this is both good and bad. It's very easy to implement and it gives you some hint of where the singularities are and what they might be like, but it doesn't give you much more detail beyond that. So it gives you a good starting point approximate information. So for example, Pade struggles to represent the branch cut because it's inherently a representation in terms of rational functions. But what it does do is if it identifies the leading singularity in the Borel plane, the T plane will be the Borel plane it would represent a branch cut by putting a whole sequence of poles along this axis accumulating to this branch point. And if you had detailed information about the distribution of these uh, poles and also zeros, you would be able to tell what type of branch cut it is. But a problem with this is that in a nonlinear problem such as we're dealing with here, if there's, an, if there's a Borel singularity here, there's necessarily a Borel singularity repeated at all integer multiples of that. This is this generic trans-series structure. So it's hard to see these because these are further singularities, but they're, they might just show up as one of uh, another pole hidden under these line of poles that are trying to be a branch cut. So there's a way around this, which is to make a conformal map from this cut plane here, bring it within a unit disk, and a feature of this conformal map is that it resolves and separates these singularities. So the leading singularity is placed here and it has its Pade um, approximation will have a series of um, poles accumulating to that point indicating the nature of the branch cut. And the second singularity which is hidden is actually completely separated up here also with the line of singularity of poles accumulating to it and so on. So you can resolve this higher order resurgent structure. And in fact, a uh, theorem in fact, in this uh, recent paper with uh, Costin, is that if you use, instead of a conformal map, a uniformizing map, this is actually the optimal procedure. 
to resolve and probe these uh, structures. Because after all, what we want to know is not just where these things are, but what type of singularity they have and what is the corresponding Stokes constant. So when I say optimal, in practice, what that can mean is something like here. So this is an example of the Borel transform with a singularity at t equals minus one. So the, the behavior is known to be um, one plus t to, to the minus 35 over 12. And so if you're interested in the coefficient of the, the, that uh, singularity, you simply multiply that by this and it should go to a constant. And so here we're approaching minus one and notice the scale here. So using a conformal map in blue, you can get to several digits, the Stokes constant multiplying this behavior. But if you use a uniformizing map, the precision is much, much greater. You get many, many more digits of precision. So that's useful in getting high precision in the Stokes constants, but it's actually more important in uh, other examples, other applications. So for example, if you look at the, not just the leading uh, coefficient, leading singularity here, if you try to probe this subleading coefficient, so you're trying to probe this point here, we find if you look at the asymptotics of the coefficients, it has a dominant contribution here going like gamma of n plus 35 over 12. And there are subleading corrections to that indicating that there's a branch cut at that point. But it turns out there's another singularity on the positive real Borel axis with exactly the same uh, location. So the same distance from the origin. So the radius of convergence here of the Borel transform is say one, uh, normalize it to be one, but both of these singularities are the same distance from the origin. Which means that if you just look at the asymptotics of these coefficients, you have a competition between these two terms, one of which is alternating in psi and the other of which is not. And simple things like ratio tests are not good enough to disentangle these two competing terms let alone their subleading corrections. However, if you use one of these uniformizing maps, so you map from this doubly cut plane using some particular elliptic function, remember that you can use um, elliptic functions to map the three punctured sphere into one of these so-called geodesic triangles here reflected to form a geodesic quadrilateral. This point here is mapped to here, this point is mapped to here, and these higher singularities are mapped to the boundary of this uh, geodesic quadrilateral uh, region. And once you're in this region here, that's the region in which you can optimally analyze the structure of the Borel transform. So with that information, you can identify all of these coefficients here of these leading and subleading corrections and just to illustrate what this means in the um, combinatorial language, if you just took the dominant singularity behavior, so this is the fastest factorial growth, which corresponds to this Borel singularity here, and you took the actual coefficients relative to that leading factorial growth, this is the type of behavior you would see, this oscillatory behavior in this wide band. However, if you include also this competing uh, non-alternating growth from here and these subleading corrections, you see that you get this ratio tending to one much more rapidly and to much higher precision. And to the reason that there are still these subleading oscillations is that the subleading corrections of this alternating behavior have a factor of growth which is extremely close to the strength of the factorial growth of the leading non-alternating term. It's only a difference of 23 over 12 versus 25 over 12. And working in the regime of just using the expansion coefficients, it's extremely difficult to disentangle these. But once you go to the Borel plane, you have at your, um, you have access to um, more analytic tools for extracting these independent terms and their coefficients using 
these um, analytic continuation techniques based on conformal maps and uniformizing maps. So to summarize what we learn about this uh, scalar phi cube theory, it has a much, much richer non-perturbative structure than the Yukawa model, which you can trace back to the fact that the corresponding Dyson-Schwinger equation has a third order structure and a fourth order nonlinearity. There are three independent non-perturbative structures, which nevertheless interact with one another because of this resonant structure of the Borel singularities lying on top of one another in integer multiples. Nevertheless, we still see evidence of these large order, low order resurgence relations that the fluctuations of the formal perturbative solution that was generated by David and Dirk, if you look at the subleading corrections to the large order growth, those same coefficients show up as the low order coefficients of the first non-perturbative correction to the formal series. And we also see that just from the differential equation, this is just a concrete example of the uh, result of uh, Costin's theorem that all of the non-perturbative terms are generated from linear differential equations, which have an inhomogeneous part, which are all encoded in terms of the original formal perturbative series. So all of these non-perturbative terms can ultimately be generated from the formal perturbative series. All right, so that brings me to my conclusions. So there are more questions in the conclusions than uh, outcomes, but let me just remind you what the goal of this, uh, these two examples was. The idea is to ask whether it is indeed possible to learn something about the quantum field theory, starting from the perturbative Hopf algebra structure, which is uh, formulated in the language of formal and in practice asymptotic expansions and to use the techniques of resurgent analysis, resurgent asymptotic analysis to uh, extract from those formal expansions some non-perturbative information, which when combined with the original formal expansions, give you the complete non-perturbative solution of the dyson schwinger equations. So I've given you two examples they're probably the simplest examples you can possibly think of, but this, the phi cube theory is richer than the Yukawa example. But we see that it's possible and it's actually fairly systematic and quite easy to implement. So that's sort of the good news. Now, the more interesting news is, the more interesting question is, is there a more efficient way to do this? So, you know, this is a bit of a roundabout way to do things. So we've taken the natural Hopf algebra structure of the formal series, used the fact that there is this Hopf algebra structure, which, which interacts nicely with the renormalization group equations as a means of generating this perturbative information. And then we apply, say, Borel analysis to this to extract the non-perturbative uh, trend series structure. However, it would be much nicer if there were a way to directly understand this uh, non-perturbative trans series structure in the same Hopf algebra context. And there are strong hints that this should be possible and indeed must be possible, just because in the end, a Carl's bridge equations, which relate, which are the um, resurgence relations, which tell you how to extract the non-perturbative information from the original perturbative series. Those are inherently algebraic. And so I, I strongly believe that there should be some nice fit between that structure and the um, Hopf algebraic structure. However, the bridge equations are extremely general and extremely formal, and it's hard to be very concrete about them unless you're in the Form, formalism of dealing with coupled nonlinear differential equations or difference equations. And so that's why I would motivate this, this, these type of questions here as the right place to start, because it's the probably the simplest venue in which you'll be able to recognize how these two algebraic formalisms could fit together. Well, another possible um, direction to try and make this work 
is to use this very nice uh, result of Michi from his thesis, where by studying the ring of formal divergent series, he was able to find a very natural and extremely explicit implementation of these bridge equations and uh, alien derivatives of a car that's much, much more concrete than in the completely general um, resurgent case. And I think that is very likely to be a, uh, a useful approach to this first question. Although even, so in the Yukawa case, we were able to do this in, in complete detail, but even in this FIQ case, it's not completely clear yet how this works. Further interesting questions more from the quantum field theory side relates to some of the very nice work that uh, of John Gracie, that these five cube theories become a lot more interesting and especially in six dimensions when you introduce more structure than just having one five field. And these, these types of generalizations would be extremely interesting from the quantum field theory point of view. Another question that's still open is how does this connect to these results of, say, Lipatov and of Renormand. So these are other sources of non-perturbative physics. And it's not obvious yet how these other sources of um, non-perturbative physics fit with this Hopf algebraic picture. Instantons are usually understood as arising from the generic factorial growth of the number of diagrams. And renormalons are usually understood in terms of the behavior of iterated structures of diagrams. So it's, it feels like these should have some natural place in this discussion, but it's not fully understood yet. Other slightly more technical questions, maybe other renormalization schemes beyond the momentum scheme might be more efficient. And then ultimately to look at some more complicated quantum field theories involving real gauge structure. And so that brings me to my real conclusions, which are to Dirk, happy birthday. Looking forward to many more years of exciting physics and mathematics. And also thank you for your wonderful ideas that have been extremely rich and influenced many people in many fields. So thank you very much and happy birthday. Thank you. Thanks, thank you so much. Thanks, Daryl. Um, in the chat, there was a, Olaf Kruger oh, mentioned that he wanted to ask a question. Yeah, okay, I didn't yes. see that, sorry. Oh, hi, Olaf. Hi. Yeah, hi, hi, Gerard. Uh, hi, all. And unfortunately, I, I had to come late to your talk, but okay. I have a question to the very beginning of the talk, as I'm yeah. sure it was there. Oh, um, no. Can you, could you go to the slide where we are starting ODE is for gamma? In which case, in the Yukawa case? Or? Yes, in the Yukawa case. So here, here it is in terms of alpha, but let, let me show you the next slide. Uh, wait, why? Oh, wait, Gerald, I, I don't think we can see your slide. Oh, sorry, did I, I see the stop sharing? Okay, hold on a second. Okay. Why did it stop sharing? Because it's Zoom. Because it's Zoom. Okay, do you see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. So let me, the, the very... to the, let me go to the next slide. Wait, this, but, so this but is, there is... is ex... Yes. Yeah. Ah, I see. All right. Yeah, but can you go to the to to the Previous former slide? slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because the uh, diff I have I, my question is regarding um, the differential equation for gamma for the anonymous dimension, and I'm asking um, wh what. I mean, this differential equation is, is obtained by, by David and Dirk in, in, yes. in the paper uh, yes. called Exact uh, yep. Solutions. And yeah. my question is whether this, you have to put in more than just the Dyson-Schwinger equation to obtain this, right? So you need that it's scalar, so that's in six dimensions and that's a scalar. That's oh, this is the Yukawa. This is the Yukawa. The Yukawa, yeah, yeah. Okay. The Yukawa, I can, but, go, but I can go to the scalar one if you like. No, no, I, 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 no. I, okay. I, I just want to know whether there's more than just the Dyson Schwinger equation to obtain this nonlinear ODE. Summarization group equation. Yeah. yeah, but the you know, no, no, the renormalization group equation you get 
that the, the higher gammas, the gamma two, gamma three, are recursively given by gamma one by this. Um, there's, yeah. a, there's a recursive formula, but this is from the renormalization yeah. group equation. But I'm. Great card Caesar. <laughs> so, so okay. you know, th th this was a short talk. I, I didn't go into the fact that given yeah. this, you can generate the Green's functions and so on, but uh, I'm yes. trying to keep, I, it, keep it nice and to, explicit here. Yeah, I, I was talking to Michi yesterday in, uh, during the, the evening, and, and yeah. um, this morning I tried to, to obtain this, this equation using the renormalization group equation and the Dyson Schwinger equation, and I've got the feeling that I'm missing something. And I think the, the something is um, about how the explicit integral is built. Um, yeah. So there's this and, remarkable duality between these two. And I think that's the key. Um, yeah. So that, there's still also, something missing in a, yeah. Yeah, just to, to, if I remember correctly, it is indeed true what you just mentioned is that this is particular for this insertion into this. So you write down this integral Mm. And then you compute the Mellon transform and, and that goes into this equation. And in the other case, you have a different Mellon transform in the six dimensional scalar yeah. case and you get this third order thing. So it is yes. true, this, this particular equation really depends on the particular integration kernel. For this yes, integration. exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Eric. Yeah, thank you. Um, we, okay. we have also a question from David. Yes, thank you again, Gerald, for this wonderful exposition. From my work in uh, the 1990s and um, engaged theories, I know that at least at large N, I had a much worse situation uh, with, with no half plane analyticity. Uh, so I didn't know how to undo the Borel transforms as Laplace transforms because there's intrinsic in, uh, ambiguity. Now in the phi cubed example, you've pointed out in these higher instant on corrections that you don't have half plane analyticity. So is your result intrinsically ambiguous? If I give you the three boundary constants, is there still a unique answer if you haven't got half plane analyticity? Yes, but that would take a long time to explain. That there is, the um, answer is yes. Yes, the, the, there is a, so this is in this um, 1998 paper of um, Costin. Um, I, can, I can send you some more details about that. But there is a way to define a, a unique um, Borel et Carl um, solution to the differential equation. Thank you. Uh, Mark Belong. Uh, Mark, did you want to ask a question? Uh, I, I, would, I would just uh, point to, to Ankroger that uh, Using the formalism of uh, milling transform is quite easy to to obtain the the, the, the equation that uh, uh, for the nonlinear linear equation for for gamma t three. Yeah. yeah, that's a very natural way to. Do. We have uh, uh, one more question from Enrico also. Enrico, oh. uh, can you hear me? Yes. 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 No. Sorry, it was just the same thing that Mark wanted to say. I yeah. wanted okay. to uh, to answer to Olaf, yeah. saying yeah. exactly that uh, you have a natural way to write Schrödinger Dyson equation. You use Mellin transform, and then you take the first derivative with respect to L, the log, and you have uh, an equation for the yeah. anomalous yeah. dimension in a, in a general way. Well, okay, that, that that's it. <laughs> Mark uh, said it. Yeah, thank, thank you all. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right, let, let's thank uh, Gerald again. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.